because our world is in crisis, the people who know even may not have a great relationship with God, but do know God to some degree, know that if there, if there is to be any comfort, any inner peace in this time, it's not going to come from the outside. It's going to come from God, from within. We are still <clears throat> in an excursus on prayer, um, still using the fourth chapter, the second verse of Colossians, but we're not staying there. Um, just simply using the continue in prayer to take off and um, basically take a look at prayer. Today we're going to be looking at praying to the Father through the Son. And in order to get there, uh, we kind of have to look elsewhere. And the minute I go down this pathway, some of you old timers will, it'll be instantly clear what I'm doing. But for those, if it's not clear, um, in the New Testament, Christ is referred to as our high priest. And in the Old Testament, the high priest or the Kohen Gadol or chief priest is the holiest position held in Judaism. Um, the legal view of high priest office comprises of all that the law of Moses ordained respecting it. There's something important though. See, we can't really understand what the message would be in the New Testament until we actually look at the concept that's there in the Old Testament that once it's clear, it flings open the door as to why we are praying to the Father through the Son. So the first thing that I want to talk about here is a distinct separate office that was ordained, um, obviously belonging to Aaron and his line. And this is what's interesting. See, God does these things, and you don't know the sum total until you're done reading the book, maybe. But um, Aaron's line, which is the tribe of Levi, and all the line, basically all the priests descending from that line, was, it was intended to be Aaron, and then Aaron's son, and then Aaron's son's son, and then Aaron's son's son, and so forth. Along the way, there was a break. So we can count... I believe it is 1,727 years worth of priests. Um, and pretty much, except for some scant, maybe, I believe, two or three that are missing. The records are not truly clear. But we can keep track, basically, from Aaron until the last priest, um, just before the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., so it's kind of interesting that God sets up this office. And I think what's interesting is it's a partial, partial anticipation of what's yet to come. But it's not fully, there's so much information given about the priest, the priest's clothes, the priest's responsibility. But the concept itself is not fully developed in the Old Testament. Why? Because the high priest's role basically is to interface with the people to God, for God, Godward. Now, just think of this. That institution, the priesthood, it ended when the temple ceased to be. There are no more high priests practicing. So try and follow my line of thinking. Every time, it's almost like every time God closes a door. You've heard this expression. He opens another one. He closes one thing to show you what its design was supposed to be in another. So we have Jesus coming on the scene called high priest. But if you look back in the Old Testament, you find that really the high priest was doing a lot of uh, serving but if we understand priesthood as we take it in modern terms, there wasn't the concept that we use today. See, terminology used today, a priest does certain functions, and they are more manward than they are godward. Does that make sense? 
They are more catered to man than they are the ministry unto the Lord. God's design in the priesthood was actually ministry unto the Lord. We've turned it and warped it and turned it back unto ourselves. But if you go back and you look at what happened at the gathering of the manna in Exodus 16, when Moses bade Aaron to take a pot of manna and lay it before the Lord, which implied that the ark of the testimony would be there, essentially at Aaron's charge, although it wasn't yet in existence. All these are prefiguring something. Now, even the taking up of Nadab and Abihu with their father Aaron unto the mount where they beheld the glory of God seems to have been intended as a, a preparation of sorts, uh, an intimation of Aaron's hereditary priesthood. So he got to have all these special experiences, if you will. Uh, Moses, of course, was chosen to be the mouthpiece, but Aaron got this, uh, we'll call it calling of the priesthood, and there are a lot of things that happen before he's actually put into the priesthood that are prefiguring, but they're actually pointing further away to the future time, to Christ, than they are to the actual time they were dispensed in. I'm not sure if any of this makes sense just yet, but bear with me, because <laughs> this is a little bit of um, trying to make everything fit into this one little message is a little bit of a challenge. But let's see what, what the Lord can help me with here. So it wasn't until the completion of the directions for making the tabernacle and the furniture uh, that the distinct order is given. Moses says, Take thou unto thee thy brother Aaron and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. The key word there is minister unto me. And after the order for priestly garments to be made, Aaron and his sons, it's added, the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. And thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons, and it says, I will sanctify both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. So there are certain things that we can lift out of here and know absolutely connect to Christ. For example, in terms of the old high priest and the last high priest, Jesus Christ. Aaron alone was anointed. Again, this is prefiguring Christ. There is only one anointed one. That's Jesus Christ. But Aaron prefigured that. You can look that up if you want. Make a note somewhere, Leviticus 8.12. The priest had a particular dress or clothing that at his death passed to his successors. This raiment consisted of eight parts or pieces, the breastplate, the ephod, the curious girdle, the robe of the ephod, the mitre, the broidered coat or tunic, the girdle, the... Um, materials being blue, red, crimson, fine white linen. Um, so what's interesting is that these priest garments are described in great detail for specific function. And the only place in the New Testament where you encounter some type of description is in Revelation of Christ, giving that kind of uh, imagery of him as bright, shining, luminescent, I don't know how to describe this, Shekinah, he's glowing as he appears and John falls at his feet as though he's dead. The reason why I bring this up, it's interesting that they state the garments and their functions. Here, the only garment, I, I threw in gratuitously out of Revelation, but here the only garment that is of any import to us is the tent of human flesh that he's wearing. That's the only thing that's of right now to make this comparison. Why? Because the scripture says clearly out of Hebrews that he, the high priest, had to be taken from among, out of us, among men, among humankind. And there are, we'll, we'll go there, I'm getting ahead of myself, but Hebrews kind of lays all of this out in great detail. So obviously, you know, we will end up going there. But there are particulars to Aaron that again, old high priest, new high priest. Um, Aaron had particular functions basically limited to himself. Um, 
he alone was permitted to enter into the Holy of Holies. Who else do you know of who has entered into the heavenlies? This is what I'm saying to you. These are two parallels, and if you can't see it, you have to keep going on all of these analogies. For example, when he sprinkled the blood of the sin offering on the mercy seat, and the mercy seat again, all of these typify something, but they're all pointing to Christ, to his finished work, the burnt incense, incense within the veil. So all of these, if you were to go into Leviticus Mostly, some of the instructions are in Exodus. And you take these key points that are exclusive to Aaron, you can begin to juxtapose the old high priest versus the last and new high priest, Jesus Christ. The history of high priests, as I said, embraces a period of 1,727 years. And if we take the best records, there were 83 priests from, as I said, Aaron to, I believe the last one is Phineas or Phineas is the last one. So understanding the role and responsibilities of the high priest will help us better understand why we are praying through Christ to the Father. So um, the Old Testament also lines up some duties of the high priest, which include teaching the people God's words and God's ways, serving as judge, offering sacrifices, assessing impurity, blessing the people, blessing God, keeping the tent of God, tending to the altar, tending to the lamps and the showbread, preparing the holy things, keeping the perpetual fire burning, blowing the trumpet. Um, and so you have all of these, but the most important one, exclusive to Aaron, is the work done by himself alone on the Day of Atonement. And again, these all are parallels with Christ. So basic definition I have here of a priest, one who represents humanity in manners relating to God. So consider the fact that a scripture I have repeated repeatedly here, Romans 3.23, that says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and this said glory is Christ, how can any human, you know where I'm going to go, how can any human take the place of a high priest who was all man and all God all at once? Remember what I said the definition is? Let me go back and read that. One who represents humanity in matters relating to God. So, let me just say this one thing, and I'm going to piss a lot of people off, but I don't care. It's what I really do good. If you really read the Old Testament and you read the New Testament, you realize something. The institution of the priesthood ended with Jesus Christ. First Peter picks that up and says, we have all become a royal priesthood. It means every believer in Jesus Christ is part of, why does he say it, royal priesthood? Why? Because we are belonging to him, child of the king, co-heir, all the terms we've been using the last couple of weeks. So you begin to make this connection, and it becomes very clear that if the book of Hebrews opens by telling us that God spoke in a diversity of ways through the course of time and has in these last days spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ, and that there will be no more, no new revelations, no more revelations after Christ, period, until he returns, exclamation mark. Got it? So the question is, how could anybody in their right mind, with an honest heart, standing before God, think that a human being could be an adequate representative of the people to God because it only represents one half. That is the human part. We needed all God, all man to represent us, to do the adequate representation. But let me add to this. Because the book of Hebrews says that his sacrifice, his once and for all final sacrifice is sufficient. Let me ask you, why do we have priests today going through the ritual of offering the sacrifice if the sacrifice of Christ sufficed. 
Mm, okay, everybody's answering all at once. So it's very clear, the point I'm trying to make, um, I'm going to take you to Hebrews just in a couple of minutes here, but the letter nowhere says the priesthood would continue as an institution for Christendom. Let me say that again for people who don't want to hear what I just said. The letter, the letter marked to the Hebrews, that letter which was written to Christians, Christian converts who were contemplating turning back to Judaism, basically what Paul calls the curse of the law, for which Christ came and the curse fell on him. And do you want to go back to that? That's why Hebrews was written. And that book says nowhere that the priesthood would continue as an institution for Christendom. So let me ask you, why is there still an institution of human, 100% humankind priest still in existence today? Okay, you're all answering all at once. The point I'm making is abundantly clear. You see, I'm going to say it like this. If I'd been standing here for the last 20 years telling you the sky is blue, and then one day somebody hands me a pair of glasses and I put them on and I look up and I see the sky is purple, I'm going to stand here and tell you I've been wrong for 20 years and the sky is not blue, it's purple. So it's bewildering to me that people who are custodians of this word, supposedly trusted guardians to ensure that the truth can set more souls free until God says time is up, will not actually teach the truth to people who are supposedly searching for it, but keep perpetuating lies of instituted policies and procedures that have long since died out with God saying, it is finished. Makes no sense to me. So, what can we take away from this? Well, first I want us to turn to Hebrews, because I just keep referring to Hebrews, and then all of a sudden, well, we might as well just turn there. So we kind of dallied a little bit in Hebrews, and the whole book of Hebrews talks about Christ being better than Christ, better than the angels, his name far superior than any name given to anyone anywhere on earth. Christ is better than, and here we go with basically telling those people who were looking to turn back to Judaism how Christ is better than the old dispensation, how in the old priesthood, you had the blood of bulls and goats that they could not save and they could not cleanse the conscience. Remember, all of that was ministry, even though a person came, whether they were bringing a sin or a trespass offering, regardless, they came because this is the prescription of God. So ultimately, even though they're doing it for themselves, it still was ministry unto the Lord not self-service as we have done today with the priesthood we refer to today. But in the book of Hebrews, there's some pretty interesting things. One of them is, we begin, by the way, by looking at the fourth chapter. The fourth chapter in the 14th verse says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So important was the concept of high priest in this letter to the Hebrews that it appears seven times, and I don't think that's an accident, seven being the number, we'll call it, of perfection. I don't think that that's an accident. Um, but if we just kind of think about this. This is something every person who calls upon the name of the Lord should be clear on. When it says, seeing we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, he has made entrance. Remember, he was here, 
He died. He rose up. He even says to the one wanting to touch him, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. It is my theological belief that he did ascend to bring his blood into the heavens, came back to earth, and then ascended. Wowza. That being said, if he is passed into the heavens, it means that when we read, he ever liveth to make intercession, it means Jesus is not standing in front of the Father. He is seated by his side, access to the ear, but in reality, it is our prayers through Jesus Christ to the Father. And the fact that he is high priest, think of this, we, we equate the priesthood with essentially medi mediator, being able to come and speak to the one who has access to the one we want access to. So this high priest concept out of Hebrews says Jesus gives us the access. This is a very simple message, but the relevance of this, fourth and fifth chapters, really elaborate Jesus' position as high priest. For example, the beginning of the fifth chapter says, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in the things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. So there are all of these concepts that have to be highlighted. Every priest is taken from among men. This is another reason why Jesus Christ had to come in the flesh, had to take up flesh just like ours so that he could relate. It says he was not... Um, verse 15 of the fourth chapter, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. So he had to be able to relate, to understand us, and also be able to hear and comprehend like we do. So important, he was taken from among men. But what separates Jesus from everyone else, not just man, all man, all God. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and them that are out of the way, for that he himself is also compassed with infirmity. So a human priest in the old dispensation still had to make offerings for himself because he himself was not perfect. And here's where this wonderful juxtaposition of old and new, we have Jesus who knew no sin, so he didn't need to make any offerings for sin. He didn't need forgiveness for sin. We have this, it's almost like bookends that bring us from beginning to end through the Bible. So two reasons here stated that the high priest had to be from among men. One, because he had to be able to relate to our sin and suffering, even though it says he knew no sin. The other one, obviously, um, second condition, he had to be human. I want you to think about this. That can't be the whole sum total though. See, to be human brings us back, strictly human brings us back into the old dispensation where the priest is going through the prescriptions but has no power to do anything but dispense the prescriptions of God. Does that make sense? So let me ask you, what is the difference between that priesthood back then and what goes on today called the priesthood? No power. Not unless you're invoking the power of Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus Christ, for yourself as the individual can for themselves, not for another. You can pray for another, but not as an invocation. In other words, we don't use a mediator. We have direct access. And if there is a, a mediator concept, it is Jesus as being the key to get through the door to God the Father, if you want to do it like that. Um, now, there was a problem. It's kind of interesting. There was a problem when the writer was writing this. I, I can even see in the flow where I could see the argument being made for those that were well-versed in Judaism. Well, wait a minute. How can you be, how can the writer be saying Jesus is better than, better than this, better than that, and even brings up the old priesthood and kind of interesting, you can see what the problem is. Somebody who's wanting to make an argument will say, well, wait a minute. The priesthood started with Aaron and his Levitical line down and goes through his sons, their sons, by descent. And as I said, 
I believe it's after captivity. There's a jump to the next priest, which I believe is in the house of, it's after Zadok, the house of Ithamar, which is completely out of sync and completely out of the line of Levi. However, we have Christ, who is from the royal line of Judah, so that's his kingly part. But what about the priesthood part? Well, the writer of Hebrews solves that and goes back behind before the Aaronic priesthood to Melchizedek and says, and even referencing Melchizedek out of Genesis 14, whom, if you know the story, Abraham goes out to basically to fight against these other evil kings. And it's uh, kind of interesting. Melchizedek brings wine and bread, basically lays a benediction on Abraham, and Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek. He basically fades from the picture and reappears in Psalm 110 and then is mentioned repeatedly in the New Testament. And I taught on this, a lot of, especially a lot of you old king's houses kind of ha gave me a little bit of a hard time with this. But uh, nowhere in this book, if you were understanding the reason for mentioning Melchizedek, could you assume that Jesus is Melchizedek, even though I could make a case for it. But the reason, the very reason why the writer highlights Melchizedek, who had neither mother nor father, and we know that Jesus has a father in heaven and had at least some type of earthly mother. Do not make this mistake. Now, just because his name is Melchizedek, Melchi, King, Sidek, King of Righteousness. Well, use the same lo logic when you look in the Old Testament and you find the, the fellow whose name is Adonai Sidek, which is Lord of Righteousness, and he was an evil man. So don't, don't go running off on these... Uh, <laughs> and think, ah, I got something here. But my point is, the writer of Hebrews highlights Melchizedek for a reason. Some of these folks thinking of turning back to Judaism would have said, well, wait a minute. No. Jesus is not of the line of Levi, of the priestly line. So how can he be our high priest? The writer of this letter says, Jesus, high priest, like of the line or of the lineage or of a type like Melchizedek. In other words, out of order, but still appointed by God. And don't make any mistake about this. This is why the writer included Melchizedek in the Hebrews letter to show, to demonstrate to those people thinking, well, how could Christ descend from Levi to show he didn't need that because Melchizedek comes out of nowhere and basically disappears back into the same abyss. So the writer is saying, don't get hung up on all of these rules and regulations of Judaism or of the old way, because even God himself is a great believer in changing it up and doing whatever he wants. And he did that with Melchizedek, who is called a priest of the Most High God. And in some places, I believe there are two references called high priest. So there is a reason why he is in here, and that is to further make us understand Jesus' high priest standing. Um, then, if you want to really mix things up, go a little crazy. Ooh, crazy in the Bible, right? Okay. Yeah, that looked good, too. All right. I'll read something to you. It's uh, a few verses out of Zechariah. I'll read it to you so you don't have to turn there to show you how even prophetically, hundreds of years, well, I shouldn't say that much, but it's a couple hundred years before Christ, there is a picture painted of king and high priest from the prophet Zechariah. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even of Heldai, and of Tobijah, and of Jediah, which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day, and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take silver and gold, make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. He shall grow up out of this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and sit 
and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. I could keep reading, but that's enough to show you prophetically it was foretold of Christ to be both king and priest. So why am I telling you this? Because back in the book of Hebrews, over and over and over, and it is probably the best book to make this case, we are told we have access. If you turn back to that fourth chapter, verse 16 of Hebrews, let us therefore come boldly, come with clarity, come with confidence, come with great understanding that God wants our simplicity. He wants our sincerity. And we bring all this to our high priest who is able to take, think about this now, to take our petitions, our needs, our prayers, and bring them essentially into the ear of God through the vehicle of Jesus Christ. Failure to, it's a, as simple as it is, failure to understand that is like going to knock on a door, a red door, and there are 20 red doors on the block, and you just keep trying any door to see if somebody will open, if you know the person behind the door. It doesn't work like that. So the important thing here is that over and over in this letter it says, he lives, he ever lives to make intercession for us. How much more clarity do we need? So if you, in your spare time this week, maybe you'll take up reading a little bit of Hebrews to see Jesus, the great high priest. If you travel through uh, the whole, basically the whole letter, Jesus is better, better, greater, better. But there are some things to highlight in here. So let's do that in the seventh chapter. In the seventh chapter, the writer returns to the subject of Melchizedek. Let me read a little bit. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness and after also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. And I know you can make a real good case. That's Jesus right there. That's not my point, so stay on point with me. But made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So kind of interesting, but more interesting in this chapter, you see something that I want to highlight. Beginning first at, start at verse 22 of the seventh chapter, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, better, better testament, better this, better that. Verse 23, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. They died, they were human. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. So the first thing, put somewhere, I put mine as a bullet point, eternal and unchangeable. So we have this high priest. Why would you, why would you settle for just a human priest who has the same amount of power as you, has the same amount of everything as you, versus the high priest who ever liveth to make intercession for you, who is eternal, unchangeable, uh, in verse 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, to able to thoroughly save. Why would you bring your petitions, your concerns, or your cares to someone who cannot save you? That's a good question to ask some of my Catholic friends. There, I just said it. Why would you ask of someone, why would you ask someone to absolve you of something that they have no power to absolve you of? 
No man, no woman, no human can release you of your sins. And why is it we hear priests saying, my sins are forgiven after confession? No man, no human can, you can, we can forgive one another, but we cannot forgive sins. That is God's responsibility alone. And anyone who sticks their finger in the pot trying to usurp God and then plays a blind eye, basically the blind leading the blind, and you don't think that there's consequences to that? For hundreds, no, thousands of years, people being led astray under the guise that this is the proper and true way of Christendom, and it is not. And I will keep standing here, not because I'm a Protestant, I will keep standing here because I'm a person of the book who actually reads this book, so I know what's in it. So anyone who wants to argue this with me, bring it on. Verses 26 and 27, for such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So here we can glean that he is set apart, faultless. He's perfect. Why would you talk to, confess to, ask of someone who is not perfect? That's what Christianity is about. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And all other relationships develop out of it on the proper level in their right order. There, you see, this is the thing that drives me nutty. Okay, I am, I'm a pastor, okay? But before I'm a pastor, I'm a child of God, which puts me in the same camp as you. A sinner being saved by grace, struggles with temptation, the frustration of desiring to be more for God and yet falling short. So how could anybody put on me and say, well, you're held to a higher standard. Why? I'm just like you. Because I stand here and I teach the Bible. See, these are these subtle things that if you accept them, it's kind of like um, the wokeism happening. If you accept just a little bit, give way just a little bit, it can open up the door to everything else so that you no longer have a true concept of what God desires and how God set up things, but it gets a little blurry because we just have to add in our little two cents because it, it, it's valuable to us, but it means nothing to him. This is my frustration, and it's perpetual, by the way. Verse 28, For the law maketh men high priests which have an infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Let me read that again because that is what I've been saying now for uh, the last possibly 50 minutes. For the law maketh men high priest which have an infirmity. Not half man, half God, all man, infirmity, frail, no power. Or if we want to say power, the same power that any other child of God would have. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. So what are you going to choose? Are you going to bank on the son of God as he is my priest, my only high priest, the only one I need as a priest? Or are you going to bank on what man has, and I, I mean very generically, mankind, humankind, has engineered as the way of approach? Are you going to take God and his word or humankind's design and humankind's imagining of what God wants. Now, listen, if you're going to play the game, then play it to your own advantage. But if you're going to be a Christian, you better be doing it God's way. And God has laid it out pretty clear. He's the boss. He's eternal, unchangeable, able to thoroughly save. He is set apart, faultless, perfect. He's appointed by God. And if you put all this together then I go back to that fourth chapter where I read that 16th verse where it says we are to come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. I want you to think of this. Come with great confidence. Come with great knowledge. Come with great certainty. Come with great understanding of who he is and what he does. As I said, he does not stand in front of the Father. He's sitting at his right side. 
that means he may speak to him. Not, you know, we have this warped idea of the Trinity itself and how we have access to God. This is the other mind-boggling thing because Jesus is our high priest and the scripture says he has passed into the heavenlies and he is ordained to represent us and he ever liveth to make intercession. All of these things add up to when I am praying to the Father, our Father, I am praying through the Son, through his finished work, through everything that he accomplished which makes the access to God the Father possible. So, lastly, and I like this, later on in, in the letter, it says, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. I just spelled that out. Um, now, let's make some connections here. The tabernacle and the temple of old, whether you think of it like this or not, was designed for one thing, to show mankind the impassibility that there was something separating us from God, that God chose one individual in that line perpetually to be the representative to make atonement for the people but only one person amidst a whole hundreds of thousands of people, which tells you God's design was to basically keep the people away, not to bring them in. This is, again, this is our warped thinking. We think, oh, well, God erected this tabernacle so that people would come. No, so that his presence could be amongst the people, so that he could be there amongst them. See, we, we always make it for us. But what about if God was doing this for himself, for his good pleasure? So it's important when we conceptualize Jesus' as high priest. Um, and, of course, as I said, the connection to the tabernacle or the temple was to keep us out. Jesus entering in to the heavenlies allowed us access in. And when it says the temple veil was rent, from top to bottom. Imagine that when the act, the ultimate act, it is finished, happened on the cross. Imagine invisible hands of God taking that veil, invisible hands, from top to bottom, from his position, now because of Jesus' finished work, opening up to let us in. But prior to that, all designed to keep man walled away, to show us our imperfection, our frailties, our sinfulness now enter in. So it is the way of approach that is important. And if we make our petitions to the Father through the finished work of Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Think about that. That's a clear reminder when we, we pray something and we, we finish our prayer in Jesus' name. It's a clear reminder. It's like saying, and don't forget the exclamation mark or the key that opened the door was Christ dying at Calvary and raising up again in Jesus' name. That's, that's your reminder that there is no prayer that we will make Godward that does not have a drop of blood in it. That is the important connection. That failure to make that connection keeps you outside of God's presence. And you might say, well, how can that be? Well, it, it is. It's the way God has laid it out and made it abundantly clear. So I'm going to bring all this together and say kind of a little bit like a chiasmus here. So we could say Jesus is our high priest. The Old Testament Old Testament high priest taken as he was from among men appointed by God and then we have Jesus appointed by God Jesus 
was taken out from among men. New Testament high priest, Jesus. So kind of in a chiasmus way of looking at it, A, B, C, C, B, A, showing us if the way of approach that God designed in the old and it had all of its offerings and all of its sacrifices but could not save, could not make the connection for us. And then we step into the new and we see everything that God laid out, we'll call it what we believed was the reality, was in fact the shadow pointing to the reality Christ, pointing to the true high priest, and now let me kind of depart from this now to kind of bring all this together because I believe people get very confused about this. I think this is the simplest way to show you how our prayers are directed to the Father, the conduit, if you will, the, the gateway or the, the doorway is Jesus. And so we pray to the Father through the Son by the Spirit. So next week I will show you from a different group of scriptures what that might look like so we can put that all together. But right now I want to talk about something that kind of I mentioned several times, but it's time for me to elaborate and make clarification. Some of my listeners do not know that I, I came out of a different background. Most of you sitting here do, but a lot of the folks, newer listeners, don't. And so, you know, if, if someone has traveled through different experiences, we don't, this is why we don't do testimonies here, because it's somebody's personal experience. However, this is a testimony I feel adequate enough to speak right here. And that is, if, let's just say for the first 15 years of life, I believed a certain way. I believed that... Um, Things are passed down to you, like confession, things that are probably not, uh, they're not even logical, but they're passed down as, this is what you do if you're a person of the faith. And I remember as I started reading the Bible and getting more acquainted with the reality of my real faith, not what was dogmatized to me, that I begin to actually get a little bit angry. You know, I had not had a Bible. I didn't have the, the capacity. I tell you, we have Bibles. Go check it out. But in that day, I was like, you don't need a Bible. Just take, you know, take my word for it. You don't need to look. You don't need to read. Just listen. But I wasn't building a relationship, and I certainly wasn't understanding what I understand today. And maybe this is the underbelly of wanting to spare some of my listeners, some of you who are you looking for the truth and you, des you desperately want to understand more about God, but who to believe, who to listen to, because this church over here says this, this minister says that, that pastor says that, and that's why I say to you, please read this book, or at least follow along with me so that you're able to see what I'm saying is not my opinion. And when I have an opinion, I tell you it's an opinion, which is not very often but that you're able to see it for yourself and understand why the insanity of going through the motions of ceremonial stuff that God doesn't even want. He said, this institution is finished. I'm done with it. Now, again, there are people who they don't make this connection. God basically, if you think about it, it says of Jesus, he came to his own and his own received him not. So God said, okay, I'm going to park these people for a time over here. And I'm going to go over here to these people. And I'm going to see what happens with these people, the Gentiles. And at a future time, I will turn back to the people I turn my back from. And they will recognize certain things. They will know certain things. But the, the clarity that will come... Now, I keep saying I can't wait for the day that that clarity comes because until then it's driving me crazy. You know, if you read any news articles of how um, certain ideologies are creeping into the church even. Have you been reading about that? Well, 
if the person who's at the helm is using this book by the Spirit of God, how could we have any other doctrine? It, doesn't the Bible say if there's a doctrine that, or a gospel that isn't a gospel because there isn't another gospel? But yet, how can people be so ignorant? And that's what I'm asking myself. How can people still be following a religion that God, some almost, say, 2,000 years back said, that institution is done. Now, I ask you this, if the high priest was so important, the holiest position held within Judaism, and there have been no uh, positions functioning like that of the Old Testament in the time since the end of the temple, and that's supposed to be your complete religion. You don't think, if I was a Jew, I'd be asking the question, well, why don't we have rituals that were prescribed? Why did all this stop just because there's not a temple? I mean, think about it. We're so um, genius in our creative thinking. You'd think somebody would have said, well, let's already start building the third temple already so we can start offering the offerings. Of course, there's a problem with that because there's a certain location it has to be at. Uh, so let's not talk about that right now, okay? Yes. One problem is good enough at a time. But my point is this. If we could get clarity, if my listening audience, and specifically the folks I'm talking to, to understand something, you are going to be standing alone by yourself. I don't say this to make you scared, but you're going to be standing alone by yourself in front of God. And that, for that, my friend, I'm afraid for you. And I'm afraid for you because standing alone in front of a God that you had a lifetime to build a personal relationship but chose to take the short and easy way, which is not even a shortcut to God, and use a mankind-engineered religion under the guise of being close to God you're going to be in for a rude awakening. And this is why I stand here. I realize there's people that get angry when I say these things, but my concern is only one for the souls of humankind. And no, I don't think the whole earth is going to be saved, but there are people within different religions. In fact, I was just reading an article somebody sent to me about how, you, you wouldn't think it by the way the news reports this, but the amount of Muslims converting to Christianity is unprecedented. But of course, mainstream media wouldn't, wouldn't share that with you because they'd like you to believe that we're a dying breed that will be left maybe as a speck of dust um, in some short time. The prospect for Christianity in the media is terrible. No, actually, I say the reverse. The prospect for Christianity is great. Because in these times, when people are scared, they are uncertain, they don't know, to be able to turn to the one who does know, is not afraid, who is solid, who never changes, who is eternal, who is prepared, who has the capacity to help you in your hour of need, that's the one I'm going to turn to, not some human being who wants to hocus-pocus me and tell me uh, that my sins have been absolved when basically I'm still walking around in a soiled, dirty package, even though somebody said, bless you, child. No, the one who blesses, forgives, washes, and cleanses me is my Lord and Savior, my high priest. He is the one I confess to. He is the one that cleanses me. He is the one that absolves me. If you can be clear with that, that's the beginning of progress in a personal relationship with God. And once you begin that building that personal relationship, you find something radical that you don't know very much. And even as much as I know, I think I know very little about God. The more you learn about God, the more you learn about what you don't know and what you need to know. And it becomes a vicious circle probably until the day you die. But that, friends, is called being a child of God and caring about what He thinks over what other people may think about my choices to worship, to serve, and to pray. Now, when I present this type of message to you, the design 
is not to make people angry. The design is not to piss people off. The design is to wake people up that if they are not even on the right page, this is your opportunity to get on the right page. If you lack understanding, this is the time to get understanding. If you were really searching, now is the time to find. There has never been a time greater than the time we're in now. Do you know why? Because we are the country. Our world is in crisis. So I don't care what anybody says. Because our world is in crisis, the people who know even may not have a great relationship with God, but do know God to some degree, know that if there, if there is to be any comfort, any inner peace in this time, it's not going to come from the outside. It's going to come from God, from within. So there is something to pray about in these times. I'm not, um, I'm not sure. You know, there's a lot of things going on in this day and age. Uh, talks of war, talks of potential civil war, talks of uh, disappearing or deflated or no dollar at all. And guess what? At the end of every one of those fears and at the end of every one of their, those concerns, I find my answer in Jesus Christ. At the end of every fear mongerer, I find my answer in what time I'm afraid, I will trust in the Lord. At the end of every idea that my faith is insufficient is the sufficient one. So when I say to you, pray, pray for our country, pray for things to change, don't pray. Sorry, friends, don't pray for peace. That's not actually the thing to pray for right now. You know what we need to pray for? We need to pray, and it sounds like peace, but hear what it actually is. Pray for our American citizens to wake up out of a slumber and to recognize that Americans have lost their American spirit, their American camaraderie to rise up together, together, whatever the color, whatever the affiliation, whatever it is, to rise up together to be Americans first before anything. And secondly, as I'm going to say, a Christian who isn't afraid to pray for this country, to pray for the needed change that needs to happen, but to pray for the people. I'm no longer praying for the leadership. You may say, well, that's impossible. You're a pastor, you're supposed to pray. No, I'm no longer praying for the leadership because I realize that if there is any hope for this country, it is with its citizens. It is with the people for the people, the praying people, the believing people, the people who still have faith in God. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.